When I used to run a pub, my brother Jim started hanging out with a guy known as Little Colin. And as the name suggests, Little Colin was rather small. He was 23 years old, had ginger hair, and wore spectacles. But to give you a flavour of just how awful this harmless-looking guy was, I only spent two days in his company, both also with my brother. On each occasion, I ended up being arrested for something Colin did. My second experience of life with Colin was the more traumatic of the two. We were coming back from a party in a Ford Transit. Colin was driving, I was in the passenger seat, and Jim was sleeping it off in the back. And there was ice and frost on the road, which Colin decided to make full use of. Chuckling manically to himself, he swerved the van down a side road where it first brought down a lamppost, then a garden wall, and came to rest embedded in someone's BMW on their drive. And on the first impact, my head came sharply into contact with the roof of the vehicle as the seat wasn't secured. I was concussed, I was very drunk, but I was still aware of yet more manic chuckling and the patter of tiny feet receding into the distance as Colin made good his escape. And Jim and I, we had, we had a look round at the, the damage to the vehicle. The van was a, a write-off. And then came the inevitable sound of approaching sirens. So I turned to Jim and said, I think they're playing our tune, mate. Only to find he was legging off down the road as well. I wasn't in a state to run anywhere, so I decided to await the boys in blue. And in a move that was so dumb that even concussion and drunkenness can't fully excuse it, I made myself comfortable in the driver's seat. <laughs> there was a full and frank exchange of views with the police. I refused a breath test on the grounds that it was unreasonable to expect someone as drunk as I was to concentrate on blowing into a bag. And for their part, they wanted to charge me with dangerous driving, drunken driving, no license, no insurance, any combination of the above. We eventually came to an accommodation. They would give me a lift home and someone would appear at the police station and confess no later than 9 a.m. They were all right with that. They knew where to find me. As soon as they dropped me off, I thought I might go and have a word with little Colin. He seemed to agree that anything the police did to him would pale into insignificance compared to what would happen if he didn't own up but he didn't end there. The day before his court hearing, Colin came into my bar and told me he was going to plead not guilty and say my brother was driving the van. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. This pint-sized runt had the cheek to tell me in advance he was going to drop my brother in the car. And Jim was now working in Holland and wouldn't be there to defend himself. And so... I explained in graphic detail exactly what would happen to him the moment he left the court. It didn't seem to bother him at all. I phoned Jim in Holland. You wouldn't believe what your mate Colin says he's going to do. And Jim says, I would. I told him to do it. So I've got to ask him, are you nuts? You'll get sent down for that when you get back. And it was then that I found out why Jim put up with all the grief from little Colin. My brother said, he's dying, Tom. He's got three months at best. I've been trying to include him in stuff because he's got no friends. I'll carry the can for him. As a postscript, Colin died in hospital, still aged 23, Two months later, after deliberately pulling out all the tubes they'd attached to him, Jim got the book thrown at him in court, and I was left to ponder 
over endless beers, the characters of the people involved in the Colin episode. I had no illusions about my own character and certainly none about Colin's. What puzzled me was my brother's willingness to include a friendless and unpleasant junkie in his life and to be ready to go to jail in his place. Begs a couple of questions, doesn't it? <clears throat> the first is this. How does anyone who doesn't know Christ become that self-sacrificial? I don't know the answer to that. Perhaps my brother was one of the people the Bible talks about who don't have God's law, but it is written on their hearts. But the second question is more disturbing. How does anyone who does know Christ avoid becoming that self-sacrificial? In other words, how can someone really know Jesus without becoming like him? 1 John 4.17 says this, In this world, we are like Jesus. Straightforward statement of fact, isn't it? At least it should be a fact. But what does it mean to be like Jesus? Let's think about him for a moment. Colossians tells us that all things have been created by him and for him. I'll read that to you. Chapter 1. Verses 15 to 20. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers, rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he may have the supremacy. But God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Okay, so that's Jesus. <coughs> the visible representation of God the author of life, the universe, and everything. Well, when we're called to be like Jesus, we're not going to be replicating that, are we? The Bible tells us Christ took human form and died for the sins of the world. Well, we've done the first bit, human form, but that particular act of self-sacrifice it can't be repeated. Christ imparts his Holy Spirit to those who come to him in faith. Again, we won't be doing that anytime soon. He raised the dead. He healed the sick. Well, maybe in his power and in accordance with his purposes, that's something which might be at least possible for us. After all, he did take, tell his first followers they would do greater things than he did. He wasn't talking then about creation or anything like that, but God has done many amazing miracles through Christians. But you know what I'm saying? Our 
primary calling is not to replicate the spiritual fireworks of Christ's earthly ministry, even if that sometimes happens. When John said, in this world we are like Jesus, I think he was talking about his character, his nature, his attitudes, one facet of which is self-sacrifice. <clears throat> now, you might feel that you fall short of having the character of Christ. You may even feel my agnostic brother is a better example of that. Well, if you feel that, you're not alone. I can't claim there's always a strong likeness of Christ in me. Sometimes there isn't even a passing resemblance. Jesus once said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I doubt many people would say, I've seen Tom, so I've seen Jesus. Maybe that's true of you as well. But there is hope for all of us. Let's think about the first disciples. You know, one time Jesus was telling them about his forthcoming death. I'll read that from Mark 10, 33 to 37. says, Jesus said, <clears throat> we are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Okay, guys, very, very somber moment. Guess what happens next? Verse 35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left in glory. So there we have it. There's Jesus talking about his terrible death that he was about to experience. And James and John are jockeying for position in the kingdom of God. Jesus is going to die horribly. But all they're bothered about are the seating arrangements in heaven. They want the best two seats in the house. Later, Jesus will be arrested. And just before that, he's praying. He's not praying for himself. He's praying for the disciples. And what do they do when the soldiers turn up? They leg off faster than little Colin, don't they? Not much of the character of Christ with these guys, was there? But one day, one day, they would all apparently lay down their lives for Christ because something had changed. What had changed? How did they change? Well, the Holy Spirit came to them, and that made a difference. The Spirit of God can make a difference to me and you too. But only if we let him. Only if we want what he offers. Stephen, an early Christian, had been transformed. He wasn't one of the twelve. He wasn't an apostle. He was a deacon in this fellowship. That mean he'd be on the support group. But God used him to do many signs and wonders. Stephen was living in the miraculous by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the religious authorities decided Stephen must die. But being as though Stephen had the character of Christ, the last thing he said while he was being bludgeoned to death with rocks, was a prayer 
that God would not hold his killers accountable for their crime. <coughs> Amazing stuff, but I want to focus on something else Stephen said to those who were about to murder him. He said, you always resist the Holy Spirit. Think about that. You can not only resist the God's spirit, you can do that successfully. He'll let you. The spirit who wants to turn us into people like Jesus will only turn us into people like Jesus if we cooperate with him. If we resist him, we will stay the same. Those disciples who listened to Christ predicting his death and were more concerned with the seating arrangements in heaven. Those disciples who ran away when Jesus was arrested, at some point in their lives, they stopped resisting the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you something truthfully, guys. To the extent that I or you do not reflect the character of Christ, it is because we are not allowing his spirit to function freely in our lives. It really is as simple as that. To some degree, we are resisting him. Perhaps we're comfortable with the way things are. Maybe we're wrapped up in the cares and concerns of this world. Could be any number of reasons. But individual transformation is God's plan for our lives to be people who bring the essence of Christ to others. Plan A is that we cooperate with his spirit and become people who can do just that. Guess what, guys? He doesn't have a plan B. That's it. Resistance is not just futile. It is hugely damaging to our relationship with God. And it also negatively impacts those around us. <clears throat> Listen, guys, I know that some churches tell people all they have to do is to repeat some sinner's prayer and they're good to go. And now there's nothing wrong with a sinner's prayer. Just so long as you live daily in the implications of that prayer, that you're living in surrender to God, that you seek his face, that you allow his spirit to transform you. Because outside of that, outside of that, the sinner's prayer is just yet another meaningless ritual invented by the church. I'll close with this thought. The world is full of people with needs. Most of them don't realize that their greatest need is actually to see Jesus in you and me and connect with him. Most of them are a little easier to deal with than people like little Colin. They're not going to get you arrested. They're not going to get you doing their prison time for them. They're just ordinary girls and guys who need someone to come alongside and lend a helping hand. If that is going to be you or me coming alongside, it will be because we've allowed God's spirit to transform us, to give us the desire to serve those in need and the power to do it effectively. The question is not whether the Holy Spirit is able to do that. Of course he is. It's not whether he's willing to do that. 
It is, after all, God's plan A for our lives. The only question is whether we are up for it. If we will embrace change, embrace transformation, or if we're going to resist. People, there is an awful lot riding on how we answer that question. May we pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you give us such potential to become people like Jesus through the power of your spirit. Help us to become those who will welcome the change he offers and to actively seek your presence. Give us the power and the commitment to display the likeness of Christ and the patience to persist even with those who are difficult. In Jesus' name, amen.